Hello, my name is Dion Bull. I'm an ultrasound specialist. I have served as a medical imager my entire career. Those who have served before me have crossed the seas to foreign lands, overcoming oppression and great evils, that unmistakable darkness of the world. Now we find ourselves in a new battle with the same evil, where darkness has disguised itself as light. It is my hope that the words and images ahead will reveal the parallels of the World War II Holocaust and the present-day Holocaust of abortion. May wisdom prevail so our hearts may seek forgiveness and experience the extraordinary mercy and love of our Creator. Then may God come down from heaven and heal our land. She lived through the best of times. She endured the worst of times. She now stands as witness to God's quiet voice that endures through all of time. Now it is for us to decide, continue in our darkness, or take courage and choose His truth. What if we could hear God's voice speaking to us? What if, by a gentle nudge, God revealed the voice of heaven, this for our eyes to see? What if, the Queen of Heaven came to us heralding a message of peace and only peace. What if His voice were made so clear as to reveal truth such that His justice would prevail, His divine mercy would soften the hardest of hearts, and finally healing our troubled souls? What if? The works of man, whether they are good or bad, are not always isolated transitory acts. More often, especially in the case of leaders of nations and those who are vested with public authority, they continue to subsist after they are concluded, either in the memory of other men or in public acclaim, as a result of the consequences they have had and the scandal that they have caused. Thus, at first sight, a particular secret crime seems to be only a private personal deed, but it becomes social on account of its effects. These are the words of testimony of St. Thomas Aquinas. In the words ahead, two distinct moments in time are about to collide, forcing the mind's eye to see what it has refused to accept. A veil of normalcy can only hang suspended over its false anchor until the shifting winds uncover the reality of truth. My career of 25 years in the service of ultrasound imaging has carried me along a carefully layered path, guarded by ancient souls. It is the image of the human form that so impresses upon men wonder and awe of our Creator. Oftentimes, it is the act of the will that reveals the counterpoint of the Creator, leading us down the wider path of false illumination, most certainly promising a reality designed to crush the hearts of men and shatter the peace in their soul. Now, let us open our hearts, hearing the silence in the images, so that our eyes might feel to the depth of each soul. He was taken. He was alive. He was taken and he witnessed. He was Jewish. He was David Oler. David Oler was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1902 and by the year 1918 he had become a trained artist and linguist. His skills were many and varied, painting, sculpting and assisting with architectural design. He moved to Paris, France in 1923 where he met and married Juliet Ventura, and they had one son named Alexander. In 1943, David Oler was taken from his wife and son and then brought to the German concentration camp Auschwitz to Birkenau. He spent nearly two years in the camp before his release. David's newfound freedom reunited him with his family and his life prior to slave labor. Many years later, his son, Alexander Oler, would write and publish a book titled Witness, Images of Auschwitz. This full volume, pictorial text, not only details the daily horrors that his father was forced to witness, but also reveals the words and thoughts describing his father's experience. It was time to tell the story for those who had lost their voice, to show the world the true horrors of Auschwitz. In the nearly two years of David Oler's survival in the camp, he was forced into one of the cruelest forms of slave labor. 
As a prisoner of Auschwitz to Birkenau, he worked in the crematoria. He was made to be a Sonderkommando. The Sonderkommandos were a group of men, mostly Jewish, chosen to clear the gas chambers of dead bodies. Once the doors of the gas chambers were opened, the piles of dead bodies would be need to be cleaned up and carried away for disposal. The corpses would be dragged across the floor to a team of men standing ready to do their appointed jobs, cutting off hair, removing gold teeth, and salvaging anything of value. The German war effort had to be paid for by every means possible. In his book Witness, Images of Auschwitz, Alexander Ola reveals the words written by his father. After the gassing, we must pull the corpses out of the chamber. We drag them along the floor, wet from urine, menzies, blood, and excrement. It slides. Finally, the corpses were loaded onto a lift and then placed in the ovens for burning. They hurried because the next trainload of men, women, and children was waiting to be unloaded. They too were heading for the gas chambers, not knowing their fate. Day after day, night after night, David O'Leary continued this surreal, almost perpetual movement. Unimaginable. David O'Leary was a gifted man, an artist and a linguist. These gifts offered him the luxury of living to see another day. Living, really, more like living in a hell orchestrated by evil. In witness, images of Auschwitz, David O'Leary's son explains how his father would write scripted love letters for the SS soldiers and send home to their wives and girlfriends. His father would even draw whimsical portraits on lampshades, which the SS officers would later send home as gifts. The irony of this is that the fabric of the lampshades was the tan skin of Jewish girls. This was all too much for David O'Leary, or for that matter, anyone to forget. David O'Leary witnessed pregnant women being tortured and malicious experiments being performed on their unborn babies by the infamous Dr. Joseph Mengele. After the tortures, these women were left to die on exam tables or later of infection. David O'Leary witnessed infants thrown into burning trenches. He witnessed savage rapes and murders. He witnessed all the horrors inflicted on the old, the young, and the disabled. He was a witness to their tortured lives. Their screams of horror haunted him day after day, night after night. He would never forget. Alexander O'Leary's text further reveals his father's words. Others will try to describe, not me. The usual words. Poor words, soft words, weak words, inadequate words will fall in the ears of the deaf. I will show. I am the one in charge of showing you what happens here, and now and forever, not to tell you what to think about it. It's up to you. Now you have grown up to become a witness. How could David O'Leary ever forget? During all of the times in the camp, through all that he saw and was forced to do, he knew he must survive, if only to witness. In the winter of 1945, with the war drawing to the close, he survived the final death march to Monthusen. Later in the spring, he was rescued by a friend, an American soldier. Hope returned. Immediately upon his release, he began to sketch everything that he could remember. David O'Leary did all of this to show you, to make you a witness to the realities and the horrors of Auschwitz to Birkenau. Lily Jacob Meyer was there too. She was a prisoner of Auschwitz to Birkenau. On the day the American soldiers liberated her, she was in a German barracks recovering from a feverish sleep. Waking from this sleep, she searched for something to warm her chilled body. In the nightstand next to her bed, she found a pajama top in the top drawer. Underneath the clothing was an album of photographs. In these photos, she saw the faces of people she knew. People from her family, people from her village, people just like her, taken to the camps. 
The Auschwitz album is a book based upon this photo album, discovered by camp survivor Lily Jacob Meyer. The book details her imprisonment, her release, eventual immigration to the United States of America, and finally her involvement in the Nuremberg trials where her photos would help identify and bring about the conviction of the Nazi soldiers who were at the Auschwitz camp. Meyer's book tells of a day in April 1944 when she was taken, along with her family, from the small town of Bilki in the Carpathian Mountains of Hungary. They were first sent to the ghettos, then on to Auschwitz to Birkenau. Meyer and her family arrived at Auschwitz, like so many others, by train. The hell trains, as they were referred to, carried Jewish people to their final destination, the death camps of Auschwitz. Depending on the time of year, if captives survived the inhumane conditions of extreme heat or cold, unsanitary conditions, starvation, sickness, and the psychological stresses of the train ride, their arrival at the ramp at Auschwitz was met by an even heavier fate, the decision to move right or left. The decision was not theirs to make. The Nazi soldiers in charge of these captives' arrival, and ultimately their fate, decided. Meyer moved right. Inside the sauna, she was forced to give up her clothes and treasured jewelry, was deloused and was redressed in a ragged blue dress, not her own. Next, she was forced to march to compound B2C, the Hungarian women's camp. She stood in line for hours with the other women, awaiting transfer to Czech family camp B2B. Later, they would find out that over 9,000 inhabitants of the Czech family camp were killed in order to make room for their arrival. On July the 25th, 1944, Meyer was tattooed capital A-10862 on the left forearm. This branding marked her as a beast of burden. Under the constant watchful eye of the abusive SS guards, she helped pull a wagon through the camp, emptying latrines and night buckets. The stench of the excrement was not enough to keep the SS guards from thrusting their continuous abusive blows on the backs of these women. Meyer's work in the camps went on until she was transferred to Dora, a satellite of the underground missile works at Nordhausen, Germany. At the end of her imprisonment, she succumbed to typhus, forcing her to bed rest. The end of the war marked the beginning of a journey for Meyer and the photographs she found that day beside her bed in the Nazi barracks. The very first photo in the album was of Naftali Svi Weiss, the distinguished rabbi of Bilke. These rare photographs of her rabbi, her family, and her countrymen would bear witness to the life inside the death camps of Auschwitz. Of course, by this time, they were all dead. The photos would prove definitively a witness to their fate. The images in the photos are haunting. Look closely. So much can be said about what the viewer can see. First of all, you can see that these men, women, and children were alive. They are standing, they are sitting, they are waiting. Their expressions communicate disbelief and fear. There is a sense that they know what is coming next, but it is too much to comprehend. There were so many taken. How can the person, chosen to move right or left, forced to march through the camp filled with the smoke of burning flesh, not smell the death that lingered in the air. What were they to think? These photos are proof of their lives, lives that ended in the gas chambers of Auschwitz to Birkenau. There were so many taken. Today in our time, we see a different face. We see an image of those taken. We see an image created by the brilliance of the scientific mind. An image taken, first to show, and finally to witness. In the diagnostic medical ultrasound image of the unborn child's heartbeat, we see truth. Look closely. What is it that you see? Look for the details. Truth is in the details. Sometimes the best way to conceal something is to set it out in front for the entire world to see. 
Let it blend in. In this way, it will not draw undue attention to itself. Rather, it will blend into its surroundings. It is precisely these details that will show the truth. On January 22, 1973, the Supreme Court of the United States of America handed down a decision recognizing a woman's right to choose. In the majority opinion, Justice Harry Blackham acknowledged a woman's God-given gift of free will, but he overlooked the responsibility of the law to protect the innocent. In essence, this decision transferred ultimate authority over life from the one who is the author of life to the one who carries life. The law of this land, civil law, should uphold natural law. Thus lies the responsibility of authorities to protect the good of the people. Marcus Tullius Cicero reflected on the logos of natural law. In his own interpretation, scripted in the work entitled De Re Publica, he professed, There is indeed a law, right reason, which is in accordance with nature, existing in all, unchangeable, eternal, commanding us to do what is right, forbidding us to do what is wrong. It has dominion over good men, but possesses no influence over bad ones. No other law can be substituted for it, no part of it can be taken away, nor can it be abrogated together. Neither the people nor the Senate can absolve from it. It is not one thing in Rome and another thing in Athens, one thing today and another thing tomorrow, but it is eternal and immutable for all nations and for all time. Then he further draws on the seat of wisdom and further professes, Law ought to be a reformer of vice and an incentive to virtue. De legibus. So now we must stare deeply, inward, and ask, What do I profess? Whom do I profess? And how does this lead me to strengthen the virtue of my being? Our laws state that the willful termination of a human life in the United States of America is illegal. For over 40 years, it has been said that the Roe v. Wade decision has been teaching the world that killing the innocent, unborn child is acceptable. As Martin Luther King Jr. once said, The law cannot get the white man to love me, but it can stop him from lynching me. Laws do in fact teach and they also restrain the evil acts that humans impose on one another. The decision recognizing a woman's right to choose and ultimately legalizing abortion has reshaped the minds and hearts of so many. Yet overshadowing all of this is a great hope, hope in an image that will draw us to truth. Look again at the medical ultrasound image of the unborn child's heartbeat. Look closely. What is it that you see? Each and every time you view this ultrasound image of the unborn child, you become a witness to truth. Every dynamic heartbeat image taken of the living, unborn child is proof of life. For in those brief moments, when the image is documented, there is a specific date, a specific time, and a heartbeat recorded. There is proof of life. The truth cannot be denied. Chief Justice Edith H. Jones, Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, stated in her opinion upholding the 2011 Texas Sonogram Law, Texas House Bill 15, the required disclosures of a sonogram, the fetal heartbeat and their medical descriptions are the epitome of truthful, non-misleading information. She further cited Planned Parenthood of Southern Pennsylvania v. Casey, 1992, concluding the ultrasound image is relevant to a woman's decision-making. This is informed consent. Every dynamic heartbeat image bears witness to the silent voice of the unborn child. With this single piece of evidence, the ultrasound image becomes the hinge point. This image has undeniable before our Creator. We are culpable for what we can see. This is truth. We are all witnesses to the lives that have been taken who will liberate the lives of the unborn now that their voices can be heard, now that we have proof of their lives. Who is the new American soldier? Truthfully, every time we view the dynamic heartbeat image of the unborn child, we witness 
Every time we pass by the mother carrying the unborn life within her womb, we witness. Every time we encounter the disabled, the physically and emotionally challenged, we witness. Every time we see the face that is born the time of years, we witness. We become a witness to truth. We cannot escape it. It is with us forever. We have seen it. We must consent to truth, or our just judge will hold accountable all things. The just and merciful judge can only grant our forgiveness if we recognize our obstinate denial in order to release all that binds us in obstinate despair. His divine mercy covers all. In the historical documentation in Witness Images of Auschwitz, the biographer Alexander Oler brings to light the terrible cruelty of which political systems with unchecked power are capable. If the Holocaust of World War II indeed represents an unchecked political system's capability to commit horrendous crimes, then an even greater evil has risen from the decision of Roe v. Wade. Millions of unborn children have been systematically terminated in the United States of America. The abortion clock is ticking. The numbers are staggering. The abortion counters, Planned Parenthood, the Ellen Guttmacher Institute, World Health Organization, and the National Right to Life and others are showing the world our truth. Over 61 million abortions since the Roe v. Wade decision. This decision has cast a shadow of complacency over our minds, reshaping our hearts. It allows our political system with checked powers, the ability to terminate life, all under the veneer of legitimacy. In the words of David O'Leary's son, Alexander Oler, as he reflected on Auschwitz, I also understood that this heritage must not be only mine, but must pass through me into the rest of the world where it belongs. In our time, I have been charged with showing you the beauty of the unborn child, like David O'Leary before me. Not to tell you what to think about it, it is up to you to decide. This heritage of abortion is now mine. This heritage of abortion is now yours. This is the heritage of our country. Now you are the witness. What if we could hear God's voice speaking to us? What if, by a gentle nudge, God revealed the voice of heaven, this for our eyes to see. What if the Queen of Heaven came to us heralding a message of peace and only peace? What if his voice were made so clear as to reveal truth, such that his justice would prevail, his divine mercy would soften the hardest of hearts, and finally healing our troubled souls? What if?